Good evening, and welcome to the Chatham Marconi Maritime Center's first Thursday speaker series. My name is Liz McCart, and I'm a volunteer here at the center. I want to thank you also for joining us and for supporting the program. Just as a reminder, you can ask questions um, during the program. Uh, you will type them in. If you hover your mouse over the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q&A icon. Just type your question in and we'll get to as many questions at the end of the program as we can. Wireless technology has come very far and very fast. Over centuries, scientists, entrepreneurs, and inventors have created amazing wireless innovations. Our speaker tonight will take us on a journey over this time and tell us the stories of how the technology we use today came to be and give us a glimpse of what is to come. It is my privilege to introduce tonight's speaker, Ira Brodsky. Ira writes about creativity in science and business. In 1989, Ira founded Datacom Research, a publisher of reports on emerging technologies and markets. During the 80s, he also produced trade conferences and consulted for clients in Asia, the Americas, Europe, and the Middle East. Ira's columns have appeared in Computer World, The Daily Caller, American Thinker, and Network World. He has authored five books about technology, including The History of Wireless, which we sell in our online store, How Creative Minds Produce Technology for the Masses, and The History and Future of Medical Technology. Ira has an extra class amateur radio license and has been an amateur radio operator for over 50 years. So Ira, thank you uh, for joining us tonight and welcome and I'm going to turn the program over to you now. Okay, thank you, Liz. Um, so I want to thank the uh, Chatham Marconi Maritime Center for inviting me to speak tonight. And um, what I'm going to be talking about, as Liz uh, explained, is how did we get from Sparks, which is a very um, you know basic, uh, natural uh, technology to smartphones, for example. Well, it, you can't get from Sparks to smartphones just by making smart, Sparks faster or better. You have to go through a number of paradigm shifts, creative leaps, and that's what I want to focus on tonight are what were the different paradigm sh uh, shifts that took us from Spark technology to where we are today. Okay, um, so I'm gonna start at the beginning with James Clark Maxwell. I put on the top of my notes here, did he discover electromagnetic waves or did he invent them? Because when you look at what he did, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, and people talk a lot about the scientific method, but I never hear anyone recommending what Maxwell did. And here's the story of that when he decided to focus on electricity and magnetism, it was at a time when there had been a series of discoveries made by men like Faraday, Louis Ampere, Oerstedt, Gauss. And what he felt was needed was to do something to bring some order, some show the relationships between electricity and magnetism. And in order to do this, he came up with an imaginary mechanical model. And this model consisted of spinning cells and gears. And he said uh, quite explicitly at the time that he didn't really believe that this is, this is what is underlying nature. It's just a model, but it, re it, it um, represents the relationships very well. And it was from this model, in fact, that he was able to derive his electromagnetic wave equation. So in essence, by developing an imaginary mechanical model, James Clark Maxwell discovered electromagnetic waves. And he obviously had a hunch that light was a form of electromagnetic radiation. 
With his equations, he was able to calculate the speed of light. And sure enough, he found that it was a very close match to the uh, speed that astronomers had calculated based on uh, observations. They observed the uh, uh, period of the, the orbital period of one of the moons of Jupiter when the Earth was moving towards Jupiter and moving away. And based on that, they were able to calculate the speed of light. And his number came out very close. Ira, I'm sorry to interrupt you, um, but I, I'm noticing that there is a yellow box on our screen. And it says, if you can, can you put your cursor and slide that away? I don't know if you can see it too. I apologize I, for interrupting. Oop. I see it, but um, okay. it's not re responding to me. <laughs> okay. All right. I apologize for interrupting. It's, we haven't no, seen I that understand. before. So well, wait, just it went away and now it's coming back. Okay. So All right. We just maybe you can you. fix it on your end because I didn't do anything. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, so so Maxwell never did any experiments to actually demonstrate electromagnetic waves, and he was, um, by the way, was a one of the greatest scientists. Uh, he was very versatile. He did work in thermodynamics, uh, in astronomy, and obviously his uh, electromagnetic wave uh, theory and equations were instrumental. Uh, but one other thing about you know, he said that his model isn't really a representation of the physical reality, yet he and others believed in something called the ether. They could not conceive of the idea that you could send waves through a vacuum. So he believed that all of space was uh, permeated by this ether, which uh, later scientists tried to prove that it existed, but they couldn't. So everyone pretty much came to the conclusion that it didn't exist. Okay, so um, Hermann Helmholtz, Helmholtz, who was the probably the leading uh, German scientist of the mid 19th century, uh, had followed Maxwell's work and was very intrigued by it. And he had this student, uh, Heinrich Hertz, who he felt was brilliant. And he announced a contest. And the, basically, the, the contest was to see who can prove, although he didn't say it that way, who could prove Maxwell's theory. And he was hoping that Hertz would enter and would figure out the answer with this, uh, this prize. I don't remember what the prize was, but uh, that, that he would go for the challenge. Hertz looked at it and said, you know, I can't think of any experiments to do this, so I'm going to decline. So then a bit later, Hertz got a teaching position and he was demonstrating, he wanted to demonstrate magnetic induction to his students. Magnetic induction is what, it's the operating principle of a transformer. If you have two coils side by side, but not touching each other, and you start a current in one of the coils, then it will induce a current in the uh, secondary coil. And the way that uh, Hertz wanted to demonstrate this to make it very vivid to his students was to uh, use a spark gap on the secondary coil so that when he uh, generated this current in the primary coil, they would see a spark coming from the secondary coil. And it would obviously prove to them that this was through induction. But as he was putting together this experimental uh, apparatus, he noticed that it was easier for him to produce these sparks than it should have been. And, and, and this was the genius of Hertz, was that he was very, very observant, but also he understood theory and it, it informed his observations. He, he knew what he was looking for. He knew how things should respond and how they shouldn't respond. And he thought there was something else going on here besides magnetic induction. So he did an experiment that proved to himself that what he was seeing was electromagnetic waves. So then he separated 
this apparatus into a um, spark gap on one side. And then he just made a metal ring with a gap that would receive the sparks or that would spark when, when the transmitter sparked, a smaller spark would appear on this ring. And he uh, then made all these measurements around his laboratory. And these measurements showed that the amplitude of the sparks varied depending upon his location. Not simply that they became weaker as he moved away from the transmitter. They actually would get stronger and then get weaker, get stronger again. And he could plot a graph showing a sine wave. So he knew that he was actually demonstrating Maxwell's theory. And um, he made an announcement and the public um, actually was very intrigued by this. Uh, but he told the press, this is just a very interesting scientific effect. There's absolutely no use for it. It's just something that professors uh, like to play with. Um, there's another interesting story uh, that goes along with this that I won't go into in great deal detail, but uh, there was a British uh, experimenter, Oliver Lodge, who actually discovered or demonstrated electromagnetic waves just before Hertz, but he had planned on going on a vacation with his wife. And he said, you know what? Let's go on the vacation. There'll be plenty of time when I get back to write up my results and publish them. Well, when he got back home, he saw the announcement about Hertz's uh, work in the press. I think even if he had published earlier, people would have been more intrigued by Hertz's work because Hertz's was wireless, whereas Lodge did his work with wires. So Marconi couldn't believe it when he heard that um, that Hertz could not see that there was a use for this. And uh, he he was a, uh, you know, I think, I think Marconi was kind of a, a bit of a Steve Jobs type character for his time. He was very driven. He was visionary. He was technically knowledgeable, but his real strength was as a businessman. And his, um, his ability to see uh, how this could be applied. It was his real uh, genius. And so he began working on um, communicating to places where wires couldn't easily be run. And obviously maritime communications became uh, a major focus. Um, one of the things that Marconi did in his business was uh, he decided that because the technology is somewhat difficult to work with, that he would provide a service rather than products. So if you had a shipping line, Marconi would provide your communications, onboard communications. He'd provide the equipment, the antennas, and the operator. And in doing this, he created a monopoly which actually was justified at that time because at that time there was no way to segregate transmissions by frequency. These sparks just splattered all over the spectrum. And if you had other companies uh, trying to communicate via sparks at the same time at sea, they would all interfere with each other. So Marconi um, continued to uh, perfect the technology. Uh, he added a lot of improvements. But one thing I wanted to point out that was one weakness of this technology was the way that it they detected electromagnetic waves. And that was with a device called a coherer. And the coherer was basically, uh, it looked like a test tube with iron filings in it. And when a, uh, when a radio wave came along, those filings would become more conductive. And nobody really understood how it worked. But the one problem with it was that all you could do is make those filings more conductive and then they would continue to conduct. So uh, 
what, what was done is they rigged up this little hammer. And so every time the coherer received a signal and indicated it received a signal, a little hammer was actuated and it knocked those filings back into their disordered uh, original state. And, and so it was a very uh, fragile mechanical type system, but it worked. And a lot of people, uh, a lot of uh, amateurs began building these kinds of systems to uh, communicate. So this is where we come though to uh, a major paradigm shift because what Marconi did and, and all his work was, was certainly necessary, but um, sparks were a dead end. There was no way that you could add other information to sparks. Although our next figure tried, Reginald Fessenden, a uh, Canadian inventor, he understood intuitively that sparks produce damped waves, which you see on the left, and that uh, what you really need are continuous waves. Because if you had a continuous wave, then you could combine other waves with it, like audio signals, voice signals. But he tried to do it with sparks and he created something called the rotary spark transmitter. It just produced sparks very rapidly. And he was able to produce some very, very fuzzy audio with that. Uh, but uh, it obviously was not very promising. He later came up with the idea of, uh, since an, an alternating current generator produces a continuous wave, but normally a generator runs at relatively low speeds. You wouldn't be able to put voice signals on top of a generator signal running at uh, say 60 Hertz. So he uh, uh, contracted with some of the manufacturers like Westinghouse to develop much faster uh, running alternators, generators. And he was able to transmit uh, voice with that. He was credited with actually making the first voice and music transmission, although uh, it was never really properly documented. Uh, but it's most people agree today that uh, most historians agree that he did, in fact, do this. So we come to our next paradigm shift. Remember, I talked about the coherer and how it was a very um, uh, fragile and uh, mechanical type device. While well, Ambrose Fleming discovered, people were, were experimenting at this time with, with uh, glass tubes, evacuated glass tubes. This is what Edison used to make the light bulb. It was used to make x-rays. <clears throat> and Fleming was experimenting with it and he discovered that if you had a cathode at one end and an anode at the other, that you could detect electromagnetic magnetic waves. You didn't have to have the hammer to reset things. And it turned out it was, a, it was much more sensitive than the coherer. So that was a big breakthrough. But the next breakthrough was even bigger. And that was the triode vacuum tube. And the person who deserves credit for that is Lee DeForest. Although I personally, personally believe from my reading of the history that yes, DeForest made the first triode and he got it to do some things, but he didn't really understand fully how it worked. And the, the next individual who really did understand was Edwin Armstrong. And he went on to develop the regenerative, regenerative receiver which took the output from the triode and fed it back in as input and created a feedback loop. And if you could control that feedback loop, you could do two different things. You could amplify a signal, or if you let it go into oscillation, you could produce beautiful continuous waves. So this was a huge, huge uh, breakthrough. And um, Armstrong went on to invent a couple of other uh, major, made a couple of other, other major 
uh, wireless inventions. One was the uh, superheterodyne receiver, which was instrumental in allowing mass production of consumer radios. And the other invention was FM. But he ran into a bit of a problem with FM, and that was that uh, RCA had a invested hugely in building out an AM radio network. And David Sarnoff, who headed up RCA at that time, did not want FM radio to appear too soon because that would mean that RCA would have to uh, re replace, reinvest completely. And he didn't feel that they had uh, properly uh, uh, exploited the investment they had made, they had made in AM. So he fought Armstrong in court and he did everything he could. He, he lobbied the FCC and um, he defeated Armstrong in a uh, patent case. And it's, so it's kind of a tragic story because Armstrong, after losing that patent case, uh, committed suicide. He jumped out of a, a window of a uh, sky, uh, high rise. Um, but the story has a somewhat happier ending. His widow picked up the fight and years later, she got those, uh, she got that patent uh, decision overturned and uh, Armstrong eventually uh, got the full credit and uh, patent that he uh, deserved. Okay, so vacuum tube, te vacuum tube technology brought a number of improvements. Uh, and then there were all kinds of different variations of tubes. Uh, and uh, there was the first mobile radios, but they were vacuum tube based. But our next major paradigm, paradigm shift came, and this is sort of uh, parallel to uh, Fessenden. When Fessenden came up with his idea of continuous waves, the technology did not yet exist to actually make uh, really practical continuous waves. When Douglas Ring came up with the idea of cellular radio, the technology to do handoffs did not yet exist. I always am kind of amazed by the fact that Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone and Douglas Ring invented the cell phone. So Ring came up with this idea that if you divide a city into cells and uh, kind of the standard is the uh, hexagonal cell allowing you to create clusters of seven cells, then you could reuse frequencies be because before this in uh, mobile telephone, they basically had to share all of the available channels over the entire city. And so that's why mobile phones, and if you watch some old movies where there's a mobile phone, these, were, these phones were for the rich, they were for movie stars, they were for politicians. Uh, there just weren't enough channels to allow everyday people to use mobile phones. But Ring's idea brought hope that this could be achieved. But it couldn't be done with vacuum tubes. So it awaited the development, not only of transistors, but integrated circuits and microprocessors. So in the 1970s, uh, the technology came together to do this. And um, uh, Motorola and AT&T began working on proposals for a standard for uh, mobile telephone in the US and other standards were being developed in Europe. Motorola thought that uh, cell phones would eventually become handheld phones that could be used anywhere. AT&T, because they were the phone company they tend to, th to think along telephone company lines. They felt that the mobile phone would always be just an attachment to the telephone network. And so you probably, maybe you've, you've heard about this. One of the, uh, the great uh, mistakes in forecasting history is AT&T uh, uh, contracted with McKinsey Corp to do a study, what is the market, potential market for cell phones in the US? And McKinsey came back and said that there was a market for 900,000 mobile phones 
by the year 2000. Well, by the year 2000, we had 100 million mobile phones. So they were uh, off by a couple of orders of magnitude. But it's understandable because there were more paradigm shifts to come. Uh, another thing that created a lot, of, a lot of the new capacity was once the FCC saw that there was a system that provided greater capacity, now they had an incentive to allocate more spectrum. So it's, it's not really the case that it was just the cellular concept that really brought all this capacity. It was the combination of the FCC becoming more liberal and allocating spectrum for mobile phone plus the cellular concept. And what they did is they took away the, uh, you know, the UHF band, UHF TV band was created. Uh, it was very uh, extensive amount of spectrum and only a tiny amount of it was being used in any one city. So the FCC decided to take away the top 13 channels and allocate those to cellular telephone. And so the, uh, uh, something that you can almost guess from this is that if you had an old TV that covered those channels, once those uh, channels were reallocated, you could hear cellular telephone conversations on your TV. Um, I mean, you had to tune to those channels. And actually, they made it illegal to tune your TV to those channels. But uh, obviously, some, some people uh, could not resist the temptation. Uh, however, you would only hear were you to have done this, you would only hear one side of the conversation because uh, with analog cellular, the conversation, the mobile was transmitting on a different frequency than the base station. So cellular telephone took off in the early 1980s. It was launched in 1983 in the US. I think it was launched actually first in um, either Scandinavia or the Middle East. It's, it's all in my book. Um, and the US had one analog cellular standard and Europe had multiple standards. And um, I should explain that analog is, you know, analog is, is, these are signals that vary continuously. Whereas digital are signals that are discrete you send ones and zeros with digital. But pretty much everybody agreed in the industry that if you could go to digital cell, you could migrate from analog technology to digital, that you could get greater capacity. You could develop smaller phones because now you could put everything in integrated circuits. You could probably uh, lower the power requirements and you could add a ton of new features. But of course, getting there uh, was a bit of a, a challenge. So the U.S. Uh, decided, the US, there, was, there was a big debate in the U.S. about which digital standard should we go with. And uh, there were competing camps. And the, uh, the attitude at the time was, let's, let's let the market decide. So the U.S. decided to go with three different standards, time division multiple access, code division multiple access and GSM, which is actually was the European standard. So the US was moving from one nationwide analog standard to multiple digital standards, while Europe was going from multiple national standards and you couldn't travel from one country to another in Europe and still use your phone. Um, and they were moving to one continent wide standard and this gave the Europeans a, uh, an opportunity to really uh, boost their uh, position in the cellular market. Uh, and in fact, that's how Nokia, for example, became the dominant manufacturer of, uh, of cell phones. Okay, when you go to digital, uh, the big problem that you have in, the thing that you want to do when you go digital is you want to go to higher and higher speeds. You can do text messaging at low speed. You can do voice at medium speeds. 
You could do streaming music if you go a bit faster. You can do streaming video if you go faster than that. You can do virtual reality if you go even faster. Virtual reality with six degrees of freedom. So there's been this constant uh, race in telecom, both in wireless and wired, to go to faster and faster speeds. But the challenge in the wireless realm is that the faster you go, the more likely your waveforms are going to interfere with each other because you're transmitting in free space. The signals can take multiple paths and some of those paths are shorter than other paths. And so when signals arrive, when the same signal arrives by multiple paths at different times, those signals start to overlap. So this was one of the big challenges to uh, make digital a more um, powerful uh, wireless technology was to figure out how to overcome inter-symbol interference. And the original technique that they used was called equalization. And it just involved testing the channel and trying to realign those different uh, delayed signals, get them back in line and time to uh, combine and rather than cancel each other out. But as we'll see in a bit, an even better solution was developed. Another technology that was developed, uh, which originally was for military purposes and that many of you are probably familiar with uh, because there's a, there's a movie now out about Hedy Lamarr and her, uh, um, her work in uh, inventing the technology known as spread spectrum. She also did a num worked on a number of other inventions. Uh, what she was trying to do originally was come up with a way during World War II for the military to be able to uh, control remote control torpedoes in a way that an enemy would not be able to use jamming to overcome that. She came up with the idea, uh, working with her, her friend George M. Thiel, who was a musician, of using basically something like a uh, player piano roll in both the transmitter and the torpedo. And by using that player piano roll to control the frequency. So by jumping around from one frequency to another, it would be impossible for an enemy to jam the signal. Hedy Lamarr didn't understand that at that time, and it's not at all surprising, that there's a lot of other advantages to using this type of technology. It can provide um, greater privacy as well as immunity from jamming. It's also more immune to multipath interference because you're operating on different frequencies. And if one frequency is fading at, at one moment, another frequency uh, isn't fading. Um, and it also provided surprisingly a, uh, a path to higher speeds. But she was kind of bitter at the end because uh, her patent expired. Uh, this technology was classified military technology for many years. And then after her patent expired, they declassified it. And suddenly she's seeing all these products and they're all based on spread spectrum. So that takes us to the, uh, the uh, CDMA standard that was developed in the US for cellular was one, as I say, of the three standards that the US developed. One was TDMA using time, time slots. Actually, GSM and, and TDMA both use time slots. And then there was CDMA. And Qualcomm developed this technology. They argued that it would be higher capacity. And it had this one big advantage, was, which was that in the cellular concept, as I explained earlier, you divide up the city into cells, and then you distribute the frequencies among the cells so that no two adjacent cells are using the same frequencies. But if you can divide a city into hundreds of cells, you can still reuse frequencies over and over in each cluster. Well, with CDMA, now you could use every frequency in every cell. But the challenge was that you had to be able to control the power 
of every mobile transmitter, precisely control it, and that's known as power control. Um, and, and Qualcomm developed a solution for that. It's basically just a 1200 bit per second feedback loop. So um, CDMA was successful and it proved itself particularly powerful in uh, data transmission. So the industry was, was, um, was still very much telecom um, oriented, telecom controlled for many years. And uh, if, if you're old enough to remember before 2007, uh, you know, there were certain handset manufacturers who were prominent, Motorola, Ericsson, Nokia, uh, some of the Asian companies were getting in, Samsung, but the handset, I mean, the, um, the carriers controlled the handset market and they defined the handsets. And if you wanted to operate on Sprint or T-Mobile or whoever, you had to get your handset from them and, uh, and, and they had handsets made for their network. But Apple, when Apple came in uh, with its iPhone, they just completely turned the market upside down. They just said they would not play, play the game the way that uh, had been played. They would make one phone and you could either use it on your network if you wanted to or not. And they knew there was tremendous pent up demand for it. And I think one of the things that um, uh, it was amazing about these new smartphones was that, uh, you know, originally pundits had thought that when the U.S. decided to go with three digital standards, that American users would have to carry three different phones. But what actually happened was, as these phones uh, were developed and uh, more and more integrated uh, and, the, and the circuitry was more and more integrated, it became possible to integrate multiple standards into one phone. And so today with an Apple iPhone or with an Android phone, you have uh, more than 20 different wireless standards being supported in one device. So in the early 2000s, it was time uh, to go to uh, the next generation. Digital had been um, 2G, then we came to 3G, which was CDMA, and, um, and then we came, then we come to 4G around 2010. Basically, the industry has uh, come up with a new generation of technology every 10 years. And that's because over this period of 10 years, there's so many refinements that are developed that they really start to pile up and it makes sense at, at, at a point to not just keep tweaking the old generation, but to go to a new generation. So with 4G, they introduced a new type of spread spectrum. It's kind of an uh, intimidating name, orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. But the key thing to know about that technology is that it solved the inner symbol interference problem it allowed you to run at higher speeds and it allowed you to get around that inner symbol interference. So it really opened the door to much higher speeds and that's how we started to break out into uh, hundreds of megabits per second and even now gigabits per second um, in uh, throughput. And another big advancement was a technology called MIMO. And MIMO took multipath interference or took multipath propagation, which had always been seen as a problem, as an impairment, and it exploited it and put it to work. If you're going to have multiple paths from the transmitter to the receiver, if they're going to interfere with each other, that's a problem. But what if you encode different data on each of those paths and you create a way to distinguish each of those paths? So MIBO provided a way to multiply the speed of, uh, of a wireless channel. So here's yet, yet another way to get up to um, gigabit per second speeds. And uh, that was first implemented in the 802.11n wireless LAN standard, but now it's a part of all of the wireless LAN 
the newer wireless man standards and all the newer uh, cellular standards. So today we're on the, uh, we're at the introduction of 5G. And once again, we're seeing uh, a tremendous growth in capacity. And it's not all due to the technology, although the technology is certainly making a difference. But there's, there's two things going on, basically. One is the idea of network densification. Build out more cells, more small cells. And the more cells you have, the more capacity, because you're serving fewer users with each cell. But the other thing that's causing a tremendous growth in capacity is the FCC, given this move to small cells, decided to allocate more spectrum. And uh, we are literally now at a point where the FCC has allocated more than five times all of the previous spectrum that had been allocated for cellular. So there's the possibility today that cellular telephone could actually compete with your cable network in terms of delivering uh, the full complement of TV channels and other services at, uh, at low prices. So 5G is promising us speeds up to uh, 20 gigabits per second, and that is going to open the door to uh, things like virtual reality. And also by having lots of small cells, it brings the base stations closer to the users and the devices. It really opens up an opportunity for the Internet of Things, for monitoring and controlling millions, potentially billions of things. So what's coming next? Well, uh, no one is actually working on a formal 6G standard yet, but uh, I think we're, we're certainly going to be looking at the possibility of these incredible speeds. I mean, these speeds are, are approaching almost fiber optic capability, although fiber optics will always be, will always have more capacity, I believe, than, than wireless. But Boy, wireless is getting right up to that. And uh, the other thing that you're going to need, though, to be able to uh, support many of these exotic new applications is low latency. Latency is the delay time when you transmit data. If you're going to do virtual reality, and I'll give you an example of, of a virtual reality application. Let's say you wanted to go to a basketball game, but you didn't, you couldn't actually go to the stadium. You could, you could essentially with a, a VR headset, you could be in that stadium and you could be able to walk around inside that, that stadium and see everything just exactly as if you had been there. And I truly believe that the technology is, is going to get us there. But that's going to require very high speeds, and very low latency. Uh, another technology that's being worked on today is called self-interference cancellation. This is literally allowing a radio to transmit and receive on the same frequency at the same time by subtracting out its own transmit signal. When uh, engineers began working on this originally, I think it was kind of a you know, climb Mount Everest type thing. I think they just wanted to see if they could do it. But now that they've done it, they've found that there's a lot of new applications that it opens up. It really uh, creates lots of new opportunities for more efficient use of the radio spectrum and for ultra efficient sharing of the radio spectrum. If you can listen while you're transmitting, then if you have different uh, priority users and a more priority user comes onto your frequency, you'll hear that, per that station immediately and be able to move to another frequency. So, you know, today somebody did a study where uh, they monitored the uh, entire radio spectrum, and they found that in the average major city, that something like 98% of the spectrum is, is quiet at any given time. So even with all this supposed spectrum crowding, it's crowded just in terms of allocating it to different users. In terms of actual use, um, it's quite, there's quite a lot of capacity that's going unused. So the self-interference cancellation technology could lead to a 
uh, solution known as cognitive radio, where every radio would be able to just opportunistically use the best spectrum that's available at that moment. Uh, we have a lot of people working on wireless charging. Some people are talking about the having the ability where you're walking through an airport and if you subscribe to a wireless charging service, your phone will be charged as you are walking without having to be plugged into anything. A lot of developments going on in wearables and embed embedded sensors, uh, software-defined networks, software-defined devices, and um, more energy efficient devices. Uh, so, you know, I feel in some ways that just as if you go back to the days of Spark and look to how far we've gone to today's smartphone, I think that even from where we are today, where we could be in another hundred years, uh, could be just as dramatically uh, better and different than uh, what we have now. So uh, that's that's uh, the end of my presentation. And I'll turn it back to Liz. Thank you, Ira. Um, and if you want to stop sharing your screen, we all have an opportunity for questions and answers now. So as a reminder, um, there's a, an icon on the bottom of your screen where you can type in questions and, and we will uh, live answer them. I will read them and, and I will answer them. Um, so we already uh, have a wonderful comment. Um, greetings from Clifton Marconi Station in Ireland. So, uh, so, so this is fabulous. It's very late over there. So thank you for staying up for Ira's uh, presentation. Um, yes. they, they also have a, another comment, a very good presentation. In Ireland, we recently discovered where Marconi built the world's first full duplex spark wireless on the 25th of April, 1911 in letter, I think it's letter back, letter frack, excuse me, in Ireland. It really solved the problem of mutual interference. And I just love this comment. I just thought I'd mention it since uh, the word interference keeps popping up in this presentation. Well, interference is, uh, you know, always been the limiting factor in wireless. And, uh, uh, you know, now we're, we're basically using interference to send more information. So uh, we've, we've come a long way. Great. Well, well thank you for uh, tuning in from Ireland. That's fabulous. Um, we have another comment from Thomas. And he says uh, when, he st when he started working in the uh, cellular technology industry 25 years ago, there were a lot of uh, community resistance to placing uh, additional cell phone uh, transmitter sites. Is this still a problem? If uh, not, what's changed? Well, no, nothing's changed. Um, it still is a problem. In fact, actually, it's a bigger problem in some sense. And that is because with 5G and network densification, uh, the idea is to have a cell basically on every block. And uh, of course, it would be a very low power cell. But by bringing the cells closer to the users, uh, you can bring more capacity right up to the users and you can use lower power. So um, there's a lot of concern about that. And some communities are actually uh, taking steps. The FCC in the US tried to, uh, tried to make some rulings to tell local communities, no, you can't, you can't, there's no legitimate reason for you to oppose this. Uh, but the courts have said no FCC, there are legitimate reasons. And if a community doesn't want it, they have, you know, it's, it's local rights take precedence over uh, other rights in, in many of these cases. So it, it's, a big, it's gonna be a big issue with the rollout of, um, of 5G. Um, but I think that the people will also continue to want all these new capabilities. And so you're going to have kind of a tug of war there where users will want more and more capability. And if they see the people in the next town 
you have new competition and it's less expensive than cable, let's say, then you're going to start to have people in, in the town that were opposing these cells changing their minds. Thank you, Ira. Uh, we have another uh, question, and this is from Liz, a viewer. Can you define low latency? Okay, latency is the delay time. So um, if you're trying to do an application that's very interactive, let's say virtual reality, and you want to be able to, uh, with your headset, feel like you're in another location. And when you move, when you turn your head, you want what you see to also reflect the fact that you've, you've turned and you're looking in another direction. But that requires sending a signal all the way back to a camera in that other location and then sending the picture back to you. So latency is the delay time and lower latency uh, means reducing that delay time. And there's, there's propagation delays through any network but there's a lot of, um, a lot of that delay can be um, either reduced or eliminated by either getting you closer to the uh, location or by uh, moving the data closer to you. So I hope that explained it. Okay, thanks. So Liz, if you have more questions about that, feel free to ask. Um, and, and here's a question from Jim, and, and this may be twofold. He wants to know that, uh, have new human safety levels been determined for 5G technology? And that probably goes along with a privacy question as well, but uh, maybe you wanna take the safety one first. Okay, uh, 5G safety. Um, first of all, um, 5G is a specification and it defines the, uh, the way the, the, the signals are modulated, the protocols, the way the bits are packaged. 5G itself doesn't really have any safety issues, but what does have a possible safety issue and is related to 5G is, I mentioned, you may recall, all this new spectrum that's been allocated. Well, most of the spectrum is at much higher frequencies than we've been using in the past. So it's up in the millimeter wave region uh, at, at frequencies of like 30 gigahertz, uh, 60 gigahertz, 70 gigahertz. And people are concerned that as you go up to these higher frequencies, that the behavior of radio waves may be different and may interact more with uh, living tissue. As far as I know, there's no scientific basis for that. Really, where you see electromagnetic waves, um, well, of course, if they're powerful, if you're in the microwave region down at 2.4 gigahertz, which is where your microwave oven operates, if the signals were powerful enough, they cause heating. So, you know, there is that possibility. But we're talking about very, very low power signals. Um, it isn't until you get to ultraviolet light, and actually it's the high end of ultraviolet, that electromagnetic waves start to cause ionization. And that's where you can get uh, chemical bonds broken down and you can get uh, uh, mutations of DNA. So I don't really believe that 5G has any health hazards because the signals are very low power. And um, also they're going to use a technology called beamforming, where the transmitter and the receiver, in order to make these very low power signals work, they need to find the best path from the transmitter to the receiver so that the energy isn't wasted. And the best path is not gonna be through your body or reflected off your body. It's gonna be around, going around human bodies. So uh, I think 5G uh, has no I think it's sort of like the, um, there's people who are concerned about smart meters having possible health ramifications. There's nothing about a smart meter. Uh, it's, 
here I, I, I would say very strongly that it's, uh, it's very unscientific. Um, I'm, I'm certainly open to the idea that maybe some studies should be done about millimeter waves, a little bit more um, definitive studies about millimeter waves, but all of the evidence suggests that those signals um, really don't penetrate your body. And again, because they're very low power uh, and, and they're not ionizing. Uh, as far as um, privacy and, and uh, things like encryption, that's a, a whole other thing. I think the smartphone, it's not the wireless technology per se, but it's everything that's go else that's going on in our, in our internet connected society. And as I was telling Liz before we uh, uh, came on here tonight, I think a lot of people don't realize that your smartphone is sending information to uh, various parties all the time. In fact, you're actually generating a, generating a lot of traffic that is of no value to you personally, but is a value to uh, these other parties. And, uh, uh, and, and you know, because you have uh, GPS receivers in, in phones, of course, you can disable that, ex although it, you cannot disable it for 911 calls, but you can disable it otherwise. But then there's a whole slew of applications that you can't use. So, uh, and then there's other ways that they can track your location. Google has uh, come up with a system where um, they can listen for Wi-Fi networks and they can determine your, app, your location based on the nearest Wi-Fi networks. So there's just so many things that are being uh, uh, tracked. Uh, I, I think that, um, well, you know, I think that we, we're, we're in a brand new world and if we want to do something about it, it's gonna require uh, concerted, concerted action by consumers uh, otherwise, uh, it's become a fact of life that, that every, everywhere you go and everything you do is being monitored. Okay. Thank you, Ira. Um, and Mike <clears throat> has a couple of comments. Um, uh, he comments that the, the first modern chip he designed in 1980 was, I'm going to just read this, 2.4 kbps. What a transition to 5G. So that's that's very quick time frame for things to to change. Mike also mentions is um, that he owns the first production coherer from the Marconi company, and worked oh. he worked on the first Nokia GSM phone. Uh, those are all uh, great things, and and I also worked in the wireless industry at that time, and so I was I was around when. Uh, you know, when wireless lands, uh, actually, the idea first really surfaced in the late 1980s. This is way before the first Wi-Fi standard. And people were building like $2,000 devices to run 2,400 bits per second or 9,600 bits per second. I mean, there's nothing compared to what we can do today. And um, the biggest application back then was wireless barcoding. So it, it took a while. Uh, it took a lot of perseverance by a lot of different entrepreneurs, and I wish that uh, uh, you know there was time to go through all these people. But I, I, I worked with a number a number of these companies back then, and and, and watched this uh, technology. Just it's just amazing how sometimes technology grows very incrementally, very slowly, and then boom, it explodes. And unfortunately, some of the people who were the pioneers they gave up or they just, you know, they just ran out of money. And, and, and then the, some of the people that stuck around, they really cashed in. Yeah, great. Um, and just a, a comment from John, he actually is uh, watching from Vancouver, Washington and says, thanks, uh, well done. So thank you, John, for tuning in. Um, we have a question from Liz, a viewer. When do you expect to see 6G? Well, if you look at the, uh, the different generations of cellular technology, they've been about every 10 years apart. So, you know, now what's happening in the, in the early days, um, there was a lot more, I think, uh, basic issues to be argued over 
And so you had different approaches and you had people trying to, to come to market early with these approaches. I think now you're, there's, because the technology is, is mature, that there's more cooperation and more of a uh, consensus that we are all gonna do this together. And so it's gonna be a very planned and um, precise uh, development process and rollout process. But I would say just given the pattern that every 10 years there's enough cumulative advances that it's time to do something new. And, and since we're just now rolling out 5G, so I would look to the early 2030s for uh, 6G. And sure enough, some people will say, do we really need the 6G stuff? But if you want to get to uh, a terabit per second, you're going to need 6G. Okay, okay, thanks, Ira. All right, a couple more questions um, from Thomas. Has TDMA been totally replaced by CDMA? Is GSM used in the United States? Uh, GSM um, has been used in the US. Um, I am not up on whether all of the GSM networks have been turned off. You know, your phone has supports multiple standards and especially like in rural areas. Uh, I mean, we had phones, uh, digital phones that would fall back to analog when you go in a rural area. Uh, we had those for quite a long time. I think most of the analog networks have been turned off now, but um, there's probably still, there may, I know there's some 2G out there in the world still, which would be GSM. Um, there's certainly 3G and 4G. Um, so, um, I'm sorry, was that the only question was, has, has it been turned off? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, so I, I don't know that it's, I think that there's still um, some of an operation because it, you know, now we're covering the entire planet and there are remote areas and poor areas where uh, they're not gonna be the first to, to migrate to the new technologies. Okay, thanks. Uh, Peter has a question, and I think Peter is a ham radio operator who have a call sign here. What do you think is the largest technical obstacle to future communication advancements? The largest technical obstacle to future communication advancement? Um, <laughs> well, I guess I would be tempted to say the laws of physics, except that during my career, um, and I didn't really highlight this during the presentation, but when I mentioned CDMA, there was quite a battle over whether CDMA would work. And there were people who said it was a fraud. And I got involved in that because I did some research on it. And I thought, you know, I don't know if it's going to be as great as they said, but I see no reason why uh, it wouldn't work. But there were people saying, no, it, it, if you really understood the technology, it, it's an attempt to violate the laws of physics. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that a lot of times um, what people think violates the laws of physics doesn't. Then on the other hand, there are truly laws of physics that can't be violated. So uh, I, I'm just adding a word of caution there. Um, I think the big challenges going forward are gonna be the same ones that they always were. And that is uh, more cultural uh, in making sure that we continue to encourage people to develop innovative and unique solutions. Because as technology matures, most of the stuff gets channeled into committees and into standards. And we, we have to make sure that we keep open those other channels, those channels for alternative technologies. Uh, and as long as we do that, I think that uh, there's, there's no telling what will be possible in the future. I mean, I, I would just say watch Star Trek to, to get a sense of it. I, I even see some things in terms of wireless where Star Trek was already probably uh, behind what we can do other than the, tra the tra transporter. Uh, but in terms of their uh, communicators, uh, you know, hearing all that static, no, you're not. You're not going to hear all that static. Okay. 
Thanks. All right, our, our final question, because I know we're holding you up, up a bit here. Um, uh, Rob would like to know, uh, what, what do you think is the impact of Elon Musk's satellite network? Elon, um, sorry. <laughs> Elon Musk. I haven't looked um, at his particular uh, network. I believe it's a low Earth orbit uh, uh, with a very, very large number of satellites, if I remember correctly. But you know, we went through, originally there was um, Global Star and Iridium. And when these networks were proposed, a lot of the world still didn't have cellular coverage. And so it seemed to make sense at that time to use satellites to fill in the rest of the world. Well, while they were developing those networks on paper and while they were beginning to build them, cellular coverage just kept expanding and expanding to the point where you know you really didn't have as much need for these cellular networks so it's been a real struggle for uh, global star and uh, iridium to survive and they went through uh, bankruptcies uh, although they're i believe they're both still in operation now um, so i'm kind of skeptical of these satellite networks unless they can come up with um, a lot of new applications, because if we're going to do 5G in all these small cells, then um, you know we're going to have the, the Earth's surface pretty much blanketed. So really, the, the only places where you would really uh, need more capacity would be uh, ships at sea and uh, airplanes, almost like going back to the days of Marconi in that sense. But I don't know if there's a big, of an, a big enough uh, market for that. But there could be other things. It could be, uh, for example, sensors, environmental sensors. You could have billions of environmental sensor, sensors. If we really want to find out if the Earth's climate is changing and what the effect is of things that we do, probably if we deployed billions of sensors that we could uh, query from satellites, that might be a way to do it. OK, thank you so much, Ira, for the Actually, whirlwind to... tour. And... Um, answering all the questions, um, that was that was really fabulous. Um, we really appreciate your time. Um, and, and in appreciation of that, we are going to mail you this uh, Chatham Marconi Maritime Center hat. Thank Until you. you come and visit us, you'll uh, be able to wear that at home proudly. Um, and, and thank you again uh, for your time. Um, and we would also uh, like to thank our audience tonight. A lot of fabulous questions and people tuning in from all over. Thank you, Ireland. Um, it's now time to go to sleep. Um, and so we hope to see uh, all of our audience uh, again next month for our next uh, first Thursday series with uh, Dr. Pam Loring. Um, thank you for your support and have a good night. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.